hanging there, hanging in there. Heck yeah. Good week, so can't complain. Yeah, it has. Thank you so much for being perfectly on time. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, so folks, let me just really quickly introduce to you our guest. For those of you who might be new and for those of you who are regulars at Real Life Trading, every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, I like to bring on a special guest, someone in the trading biosphere, the community financial wizard of some sort. And today we have Jake from TrendSpider. And TrendSpider, you guys know, is a charting software that we like to use at Real Life Trading quite frequently. A lot of you are very well versed on it as well. And I just had a great uh, event with TrendSpider that I think went really well. Did you get good feedback from it, Jake? Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much again for presenting. Oh man, of course, dude, my pleasure. Uh, if you guys do want to follow Jake on Twitter, he has two handles. So at Transpider Jake or at Transpider. He actually uses both, but Transpire obviously is their bigger uh, social media platform for their entire website. But Jake, man, here's my goal of this interview is really I just want to know and learn a little bit about you, your background, your trading background. And at some point, if we flip back through some charts, that's cool. But yeah, man, just tell us how you got started in this entire journey. And then let's walk us through your trading process and let's learn from your greatness. All righty. So uh, thanks again for having me on. It's uh, great to be on. Um, I started trading back in the day when I was about 12 years old. Um, my dad got me into the markets. Um, not really not sure why. He hates the stock market. Uh, so he, I guess, just wanted me to buy some stock and look at it in 10 years. And that would have probably been a great idea. But uh, just with my type of personality, of course, I immediately wanted to just trade it and make a quick buck and get into something else and just kind of like trading ADD. So uh, pretty much blew that account up within a couple years. I think I, I entered ninth grade in when I was uh, like, what, 13 or something. So like by 15, 16, I was in high school pretty much that account started at like a thousand bucks and by, by then it was at like 90. And then by, uh, by the time I was 16, 17, that's when the financial crisis came around. And so um, I started trading my mom's money with her. Uh, I still, to this day, don't know why she allowed me to do that, but uh, it kind of gave me full autonomy <laughs> to her account. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was an, and I still am pretty impulsive, but I mean, I was a lot more impulsive with the uh, trades back then. And I was just absolutely reckless, which, which kind of helped me because, you know, I didn't, I hadn't really felt a loss before. So I, I was going into these trades just like, all right, no, this is what's going to happen. And this is why it's going to happen. I was very, like just too confident, but some of these trades would hit. And, you know, I'm like this 15, 16-year-old kid with an $80,000 position in this, you know, biotech that just had phase something news. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm up 100K in a couple of weeks from trading this. And, like, it wasn't because I had any type of system. It's because I got lucky as shit. And, uh, you know, just it was the time of the, the market. I mean, it was that volatility that we were kind of expecting over – or. Uh, um, experiencing over the last couple months and weeks. And uh, I just was in the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, this was all my mom's account. So I, I didn't make that money. But, uh, you know, it was, that's kind of how I really started to get into it. Uh, that's when I started to, um, I'd always read message boards, but that's when I started to read message boards more. Uh, someone would say, oh, the RSI is at 30. And I'm like, well, what is the RSI and why is that important as at 30? And so I started kind of self-teaching through college, studied economics in college, so really got the, uh, that connection between supply and demand that occurs in the market. And uh, from there, I graduated, started a company, or uh, started with a company that was a startup out of Duke University doing like optical spectroscopy, which was pretty much a foreign language to me. Um, and so after my contract was up, uh, doing that for two years, I moved to Denver, took a job, 
did it for three months as like a staffing agent or something. It was like, screw this. I'm going back to the markets. And uh, at that point, I had gained about 10,000 followers on StockTwits uh, and then um, started my own subscription. And then from there was picked up by Dan, who's my partner and the founder of TrendSpider, the original founder. And um, kind of from there, I have just helped not only build the business side, but the product side. So I'm sure we'll have hopefully a little time to go over some of these different uh, supply and demand features that we have and how I use them to trade. But uh, yeah, that's kind of my story. I, I started out the custodial account with my dad and now I, now I trade mostly my own money. I will trade some money of my mom's as well, but it's generally my account trading options uh, and sometimes common stock nice okay that's really cool dude that's really really cool well yeah honestly if you want you can share your screen and i'll kind of like chart dj for you okay uh as, cool. as, as you just you share your screen i'll still be recording it and we'd, i'll just kind of walk through like what what is your process like how do you trade and not and i want everyone to know that you're not paying me for this exposure i'm just literally reaching out to Jake because I know he's a real life trader. I know he trades real money. I know he enjoys it. He's really fascinated by the markets. He did sponsor the RLT retreat last year, back in September, came to Nashville. I've met him twice in person. I just know he's a great guy. And so I just want to kind of get a general feel for how Jake trades and any one small piece, some shred of insightful tips my friends can always guide you if that one thing that one person says can help you make an extra 600 or $1,000. I feel like it's extremely worth it. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I, uh, I've got a couple cool examples of the last couple weeks that I can go over. This is GE. Um, first of all, I want to say something about my strategy and kind of the way I trade. I'm generally trading the same stocks over and over again. I'm not like, you know, scanning the Russell 2000 and just, you know, playing anything. Um, generally, I am going in and I've got a watch list on my phone. And then from there, I'll just pull up the chart. Like for this example, this is GE. And um, I want to kind of start with uh, this a little more uh, simple. But you can see here on the daily chart on GE, We've got a couple things, right? We've got this symmetrical triangle that broke out yesterday. And we've got this massive area of volume holding here. Um, and what I've done is I've started the volume profile from this point right here. Uh, this is pretty much the reversal of this initial trend that was up yep. uh, 65%. So I start the volume profile here because when the trend starts in the market, the status quo changes. Buyers that used to be sellers become sell, or uh, buyers that um, are going to now be sellers in this market, and then sellers could be buyers. So the whole landscape of the market changes. And so in this particular case, what I've done is I just pretty much have used this starting point for every stock, whether that's on February 12th, in this particular case for GE this was the high of the trend on SPY. This hit a high on February 19th. Right, so, right, right. So either way, we're just measuring what is the distribution of shares since this reversal point, since we had the Corona status quo change and everything's changed since then. So what we can see is- And can you show can, us how you find the volume profile? Yes. Where are you going so, to get that? So if you go to indicators and yep. click the three dots, you just type in volume by price, or you can type in volume profile and it will come up as well. Um, but uh, you just click on that. It, it will pop up in the indicator list. Um, to make it exactly how mine look, you're gonna wanna do the columns as 50 because we wanna have you know, those really, a lot of columns to see from a, from a very small standpoint where those, those levels are. Because let's say we do 10 columns, you guys will see what happens is we've just got this, right? It kind of still tells us the same thing, but this gives us a little more of a in-depth view of those levels if we go to 50. So this is essentially now, each one of these volume bars uh -huh. represents about 25, uh, sorry, about 15 cents or so. So you can see like the, the width of this volume bar 
is from 722 up to 738 or 737. If I change this to 10 columns, you'll see that that volume bar is now taking into the account the volume from 589 to 664 and then 664 to 738 or 737. So it's just giving you a, a more fractal view of where those shares are. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Now, GE mentioned you don't do a lot of scanning. Is this one of the ones you follow often? And if so, why? Yes. Yep, I love trading GE. The reason why I like to trade GE is one, the spreads are beautiful. You, especially even on the options, are not usually dealing with too big of a spread. Uh, so like, you know, GE right now, the bid is 679, the ask is 680. Um, today, one of the reasons why I'm bullish right now, I watch the tape a lot. And one thing that I really like to watch is for the price action to essentially skip the price. So let's say you're trading at 679 on the bid, 680 on the ask. If all of a sudden you see the price go from 680 to 682, you know somebody just market ordered the crap out of the ask and took out all of that supply above. And it was so much demand that it took out two cents of supply. So I know somebody wants to get in. So I've seen this over the course of the day so far. I've seen it skip like 677 to 679. I was even seeing it skip from 684 to 686 to 687. So to me, that means that they were trying to shake some people out. Right now, we can see that the price action bounced right off this demand zone. And this demand zone is simply just where a majority of these shares are holding since we reversed on February 12th. So notice most people are pretty much break even at this point. The average person um, is holding, the average price per share is 813. So what I just did here was I right clicked and I created an anchored volume weighted average price, which was created by Brian Shannon's uh, from Alpha Trends. Yep. And what you do is you're doing the same thing that we just talked about with the volume profile, except for doing it with the volume weighted average price. And so, here, the average price paid per share is right around $8.13. But a majority of those shares are focused around here. So a lot of the time, what you'll see is you'll see the price move up to these levels above. Um, now, it hasn't happened yet. That's because GE right now, the other reason I'm playing this is because it's a laggard. Um, you know, it's 100% it's not trading with the market right now. And the way that I'm deciding if it's a laggard is let's go to SPY. And if, if this is a really cool example of looking at laggards versus leaders, if you anchor the volume weight average price from that high that we just talked about, like in February, remember we said it was February 12th on GE. Now it's on SPY. We topped out a little higher on February 19th. So when I anchor the VWAP here, notice what we have. Notice that the price is already not only through this view app, but it's way above it. If you compare that to GE's price action in the volume weight average price since this reversal, notice that we are nowhere near that line yet. So naturally, this needs to catch up with the market. Even though, you know, all oh, GE's earnings weren't great, whatever, uh, or if you want to call it not great. But overall, you know, this is kind of as beaten down as it's really gonna get. I mean, you can see how many people are break even here. In order for the price to move down, it's a lot easier for the price to move down when people are holding in profits. If you have nobody that's holding profits at this level, it's gonna be hard for that supply to come in and actually drive the price any further down. Um, so as any supply dries up here, the demand, it doesn't even have to increase. It just needs to stay constant and you'll have that move up in price. So for me, I traded this a couple times already. The first time I traded it, I traded the common stock. So I did buy the common stock a little early. Um, I bought in the 715 area, and then I scaled down in the, the uh, 630s and the 640s. So my average cost was around 673. So on this big impulse move yesterday, I decided to get out with some profits. Um, simply because I did not want to risk my capital because it was, it was a decent chunk of capital to scale in and, and get out of that dollar cost average and just kind of work, work with the options. 
But the options trade I made on this, I bought um, in this little inside candle, I was buying the, um, the May 15th 750 calls. I bought the May 15th 650 calls. And so, you know, on this impulse move up, I mean, those calls were up 100%. Uh, so I, I was able to take in some pretty good profits yesterday. And now those profits that I took from yesterday, I'm reallocating them back into GE. And now I'm actually in the May 15th, 750 calls. Now that may seem like you got, we got a ways away uh, to get to 750. But if you look at the history of this move, this thing loves to move in impulses, meaning that you've just got like a three, four day absolute rip generally maybe because there's a short position that needs to get out and you've just got to squeeze um, or the market's just getting uh, you know, some rotation and money starts flowing in uh, as people see this as a laggard. Or let's say that they just had earnings and a new analyst upgrade comes out or something like that. These are things that can possibly trigger the price. So this is the reason why I am trading this one simply because we've got so much demand here it's really going to be hard for the price to drop anymore through this area unless people start taking a loss. And, uh, you know, this is just a classic symmetrical triangle breakout. A lot of people would call this a bear pennant, but you didn't break down. You're actually sure. holding. So, yeah. so the fact that you've got all of that demand holding there is, is really hard for the price to drop. Just like from a physics perspective, like you can't, like if you, let's say you jump in like the Dead Sea or something, you can only go down so far when you jump in before it's going to bring you back up to the surface because of the buoyancy. It's very similar to how like these demands and supply zones work. Love it, man. Love it. And we're going to have, we have two questions. Well, not really specifically two questions, but I have one trader wants to take it back and said, how'd you, how did the name Trend Spider come to be? So Trend Spider was initially created to essentially draw automated trend lines for you and not necessarily to draw trend lines for you in order to replace your technical analysis, but to complement. So here we've got just a plain chart on Home Depot without me having to put any bias in the chart, without me having to even think about the levels, I can turn on this trends feature and notice that these trend lines will automatically pop up. So these trend lines are not like here to pollute the chart or to be the trend lines you have to use, they're more like idea generators. So like here, um, we just broke out of this uh, longer term resistance, which was clearly a pretty strong move. You can change this as well. Let's say that you want to do maybe a standard view, which is going to find some of those shorter term um, setups, like some of your wedges and things. If we apply here, you know, we'll see that we're kind of seeing this, this inter interesting setup where we've got this previous support now acting as resistance. I didn't even see that until just now. Double click on it, turn trends off, and all of a sudden now I'm looking at a pretty epic trend line that I didn't even think about before turning this on. Mm. Gotcha, gotcha. Does spider symbolize the trend lines then? Um, I personally did not come up with the names. Yeah. Um, so the spider kind of comes like from like, you've got a bunch of different algorithms going out and like kind of and, yeah their arms kind of finding trends and that type of thing got it we had one trader who wants to let you know that he found a really good trade that he told me about 30 40 minutes before he came with the microphone on boards or bwa he said he found it because of trend spider so art do you want to put it into the chat pane how'd you find it because the trend spider was an alert because you're right you're 100 spot on on that trade but uh yeah feel free to throw us in there art how'd you how did you play it uh, Jake, since we're talking about those some stocks, you mentioned you have some that you follow frequently. Do you mm -hmm. mind giving us that list? I know GE is one of them. I know CHK is one of them. Yep. Uh, so the everyday list is, where is it? Uh, let me pull up the sidebar. So this is, it's a pretty big list. Um, I don't trade all of these, but I keep, I watch them. Sure. I, I will, honestly, I really don't trade more than, probably five stocks. Uh, it's mostly um, and like CGC. I trade quite often. I trade GE quite often. CHK. Disney is another one I love to trade. That was a trade that I made um, this week simply because of that, uh, that ascending triangle breakout. 
Um, and so, you know, I was in, in this one, I was in the uh, May 15th 110 calls. I sold them for a, a little bit of profit, but now they're up like another 15%. Uh, but that's the thing, right? I'm not, I don't really like to go back in my trades and like dwell on what I did wrong to what I didn't. I generally do it just to learn from it. So I know what to do next time. Like, it's not like I'm going back to see, Oh God, it's up 15%. But I know for next time, maybe I scale out half and hold the other half to, to take some of that exposure to the upside still. Yeah. So Disney, I would say CGC, um, GE, those are my three kind of babies, if you will. Um, I do like to follow IWM just for a general idea of kind of the strength of the market because IWM for me represents risk. So if people are buying small caps, they're essentially buying into risk um, because, you know, small caps don't necessarily carry dividends and that type of thing. Whereas, you know, people, big investors are generally wanting to trade something that, or not trade, but invest in something that has, um, you know, a dividend. So a lot of the time you need those big participants in there to move the price. But in this particular case, IWM, this was a laggard. So, you know, we could see that this thing was lagging. Same exact idea as GE, right? This thing is just, this is the year to date anchored VWAP. But if we do the uh, original VWAP here, you know, this was originally stuck at the anchored VWAP. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, for it's forever to break out. And if you anchor the uh, this point here, I like, so Brian Shannon taught you me. You can anchor any time frame, any day you want. Yep, yep. Generally, you want to anchor from those reversals, gaps, any time where the status quo has changed, whether that's a new news piece comes out, where let's say that Disney has some big scandal. Like you would want to anchor from that point because people then have new information and that new information creates a new status quo which creates a new equilibrium price that you want to follow. Um, so in this case, I'm just anchoring it from the top here on February 20th. And then I'm anchoring it from this pivot here after we initially had our bottom. And um, I, I don't know if this was a blue raindrop. I did want to get into the raindrops here as well a little bit. Um, yeah, no, there's a blue raindrop here. But um, so when you're playing those calls, like why'd you choose the 110 May's? Like why not shorter? Why not longer? Do you always kind of do that front month strike kind of at the money? Yep. And, and if so, what's your target? Do you trail? Do you always go out at a percentage? What's your play? So for generally for options, I will play a month out. Um, right now I'm in GE and I'm only two weeks out. So I am taking a little risk there, but I've been trading GE for the last month and I've seen it literally trading at eight dollars a couple weeks ago and know it can get there really quick so that's why I'm being a little risky there and I do have some profits to play with from trading it yesterday uh, but generally I, I do like to play uh, at least a month out so right now I'm playing GE June con uh, the June 19th contracts as well because one they have a ton of open interest and a ton of uh, volume and then two just because you, I have a little more time on my side. I mean, you know, sure, I think that GE is going to go up within X amount of time, but I'm not that confident where I'm just going to buy next week's call, you know, because uh, you have to deal with theta. You have to deal with all the Greeks dealing uh, with that, um, you know, can completely change a trade, uh, whether you're, you're in the wrong just contract. So for me, definitely, um, I like to play about 10% or less in out of the money. So for me, I bought these and I, this is a great example of me just, I scaled in too early. Um, so I think I initially bought the GE, uh, not the GE, the Disney calls, uh, I think around 105. And then let's see, where did I buy them? Somewhere around here. And then what happened was they pulled back, but the reason why I stayed in the trade was because of this uh, this anchored VWAP here. So the price was holding this area. And let me turn the raindrops off. I'll go into the raindrops more here in a second. But yeah, so what I was doing was I was literally just watching this VWAP here. And I was saying, all right, well, it was it was really the same thesis I had for GE, right? We were trading down here. The anchored VWAP is here. And now Disney's finally starting to break through it. 
So I think that GE is pretty much right here or so in, in this whole process. And if we, turn mm. on, if we turn on the volume by price, you'll see that as well. You'll see most of, most of the volume was holding there. Wow. Um, and so like you- Can you compare the two on that one chart or what? I wish. Uh, we, we don't have the ability to double cross, like side by yeah. side yet, but that, yeah. that will be coming because uh, um, whether that's the ability to overlay one price action over a single chart, but um, no, that, that would be really helpful. But if we want, what I can do is I can go in this workspace and then I can go into another workspace and then we can just go tab different tabs to, to show the, the similarities here. So mm, nice. Wow. Look at that chart. Hold on. Go back to that with that Litecoin. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Do you trade cryptos at all? Uh, no, I decided I like my sleep. <laughs> Jake, dude, why sleep? What's <laughs> the point? No, I get you, man. That is such a gorgeous chart. Look at that. Oh this my is, gosh. Dude, speaking of laggards, it, on the event on Sunday, we talked about the laggards yep. um, and Litecoin being a laggard in the crypto market. Um, you know, and so laggards and leaders can be done everywhere. If you look at this ascending triangle on Litecoin and then you compare it to the Bitcoin ascending triangle, Bitcoin's already broken out of that thing a while ago. Uh, it, it br technically broke out like here. Right. And so Litecoin is here. Yep. So we're just, this is literally Litecoin's candle and you've got yep. Bitcoin literally just leading the way. Yeah. So sorry to derail that conversation, but you pull that chart up. It's like, that's just immediately looked so, so pretty. Yep. So this is what I do with other s sectors in the market. So, yeah. um, uh, like GE, GE, if we pull up GE and compare it to Disney, we can see something really interesting. It's, it's not as, the volume's not as defined as Disney, which makes me, you know, a little more confident that this could just explode. But look at the, the comparison. If we, let me get rid of some of this stuff. Just to get the chart a little cleaner. If we kind of go and compare these two, um, notice that I'm anchoring the point here on February 5th. Notice Disney hit a high in November. It was hitting lower, lower highs, you know, way before the market topped. So I'm anchoring it from this candle because this was earnings. So earnings is clearly a status quo change in the market. So if we anchor the volume profile and the VWAP from there, you can see that a majority of the volume at yep. this point, because remember guys, all of these days that happened after this point, the volume's going to show up. So this volume wasn't there yet. Most of it was right here in this point of control. And as we've consolidated at this anchor view app, that's where you can see those volume bars coming in and, and creating another base, which we just broke out of as well. So we compare this and then we go to um, something like GE and you can see it's Let's anchor the volume uh, at volume weight average price. And you can see we're way, I mean, the, we're at, we should be at 813 based on where Disney is from its lows. So I'm not saying G and Disney have anything to, uh, to do with each other, but there's, there's rotation in the markets that is a real thing. And money flows into different areas that have not, you know, performed like other areas in the market. And that's what causes the market to keep going up. We don't need Amazon and Apple to keep ripping. We need some of these laggards to start ripping, which is starting to happen. You've got, mm -hmm. your, Disney, you've got your Disney starting to break out, which is helping the markets big time. You've yeah. got your, your other players. Yeah. So, you know, That's G what I was mentioning when, when we had our session on the weekend, Jake, I was kind of talking about like, there, there's so many aspects of the market that are so, so strongly sold off that if those begin to bounce, and even, even if the rest of the market, like Apple, Facebook, Google don't, then you're still going to get that surge because energy is down exceptionally far. Financials are down exceptionally far. Airlines are down exceptionally far. And all of those are part of the S&P, you know? So if you start getting that bounce on any of those, you're going to get another move higher in the markets. And that's what we're getting. Beautiful. Look at uh, XOM right here. Same thing. Mm -hmm. We are now just getting to that anchored VWAP from the top. So this is another laggard that is going to help the market continue to probably get over 300 on SPY. And then, you know, I don't really follow Dow as much as I do SPY, but 
whatever that level is on Dow, you know, this is what's going to do it. These different things. I mean, uh, I've been trolled for calling this a cup and handle, but I'm going to call it what it looks like to me, which is about as cup and handily as you can get. You've seen this set up across the I mean, uh, most of the time you do want to see that cup and handle and an uptrend and then kind of cupping. But I mean, look at this. It's, it's about as textbook as you can get with you know, any other form of it. Look at the squiggles. Uh, I love it. And then look at, if you look at XBI, talk about the market leaders here. Yeah. XBI already had this freaking uh, cup of tea. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, was that you that posted the, uh, the bird? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that was funny. Yeah. So, you know, good old what, cup of tea. What's interesting is notice how XBI has been a leader and now it's not even really up that much today, but you've got the rest of the markets ripping because you've got other sectors like, like Jeremy said, oil, um, you've got Boeing freaking ripping after absolutely horrible freaking. And this is another thing, right? GE and Boeing move exactly together a yeah. lot of the time. So there is some massive divergence here. The fact that G Boeing is moving up and GE has not made, um, you sure. know, a buy here. Sure. So that's another thing I'm looking at is that, that kind of disconnect between the two. Got it. Got it. Got it. So Aaron has a question. Is that volume, is it buy volume or does it co constitutes both buy and sell or is it just the average volume or what's the take on the volume profile? It's any, any share volume that's been bought or sold since this point in time. So you, it's hard to say if something's buy or sell volume because for every buyer there's a seller um, and every seller there's a buyer. So this is just telling us where all of the shares have been traded hands have been right here. All of the current data is telling us that most of the shares have been bought in this lower area since this point in time. So it's the overall distribution of shares. So let's say that you and let's say that you buy the shares up here, but then you sell them down here. That's going to go into this volume range. Does that make that make sense? Yep. Yep. So great. it's it's really just the aggregation and distribution of the shares and how many shares have been traded. So if we if we right click on this and go to properties, you'll be able to see. Um, the labels here. Uh, so you'll be able to see how many, uh, sh how many shares are traded. So here, 179 million shares are being held, 149 million. I just don't like having these numbers on my, the tips, but that, yeah. that will show you the actual levels. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. I dig that. And what then some other indicators that you love using on TrendSpider? Oh, I mean, for me, raindrops are crucial. Raindrops were the way that I had a feeling that this spy breakout uh, the other day was definitely real. Um, I would say this is, a, and I made a video on this on Monday, which is kind of cool because I, uh, you know, we were able to see this in action, like as it was forming. Um, so what I did here was I'm just going to take the volume profile off. What we have here is we've got this previous high. So let me zoom in here. So if we look at this chart just with the candlestick, I mean, I'm not saying this is bearish, but I'm also not saying based on close that it's bullish. We didn't close above that area. Um, so to me, I don't really know, was there actually conviction by the buyers in this wick? Was it some person that was short that just got, you know, uh, margin called and had to, you know, buy at whatever price they could get and, spiked it up for a second. What, how do we know if there was any type of actual buying there? So what you can do is you can use the raindrop and you can compare the regular candle to the raindrop, which is a volume based candle. So in this case, I'm going to highlight, I'm just going to do an arrow at this candle. So you guys know it's the same candle on the raindrop. And here on the raindrop, you'll see a completely different picture here. You'll actually see that within that wick, and I'll, I'll decipher the raindrop here in a second. Um, you can see uh, with the raindrop, you've got pretty much a typical bar chart on the first half of this. So you can see uh, you've got your left bar and your right bar. Generally, this is your open on your left and your close on the right. But instead, the left bar is your volume weighted average price for the first half of the period. And then this is your volume weighted average price for the second half of the period. So the function, the color is a function of whatever this second candle is doing. 
if the right side is higher than the first half, i.e., you know, if it's a bar chart, the, if the close is higher than the open, it's going to be green. If the volume weight average price for the second half of the period is going to be above the left, it's going to be green. The red is the opposite. If the volume weight average price on the second half of the day is lower than the first half of the day, i.e., the right bar is lower than the left, this is your red. When you've got the volume weighted average price for the second and the first half of the day equaling the same thing, that's when you have these blue raindrops. Now, the second, and I'll get into blue raindrops here in a second. The second part of this is the ability to see the actual volume profile for whatever period you're looking at. For this particular example, you've got the daily candle. So you can see this little blob of volume on the left is where there was volume located within this day's range during the first half of the period. On the second half of the period, this big bulge of volume tells us that there was a lot of volume at the top of the day's range. So if we compare this and you compare, you know, what this looks like versus this, we can see that within this wick right here, all of that volume was actually within the wick. And so a lot of people will say, well, how do you know if that's buying or selling? Um, well, we know it's selling and we know it's buying. We have to know who's in control. And the fact that all of those shares were able to be accumulated above the resistance line tells us that buyers were in control. And then the next day, you've got this huge gap up. So this is another strategy that I do um, a lot of the time. I'll, I like to do it on CGC. Um, generally, into the end of the day, let's say 15 minutes before the close happens, you will see most of the volume has formed on the raindrop. So you'll see this big blob of volume into the second half of the day into <laughs> close. And what I'll do is I'll buy, let's say, you know, maybe a contract a month out and I'll go a little heavier just because, you know, I'm okay with taking 10% on a, on a gap up on a contract if I'm in enough money. Um, you know, I don't always have to get the 40 to 50 percenters because if I'm in a little more, if I'm in a little heavier, I'm going to make the same thing I made on the heavier position with 10% than I make on the smaller position at 50%. So, so my, my trade is I'll go in within 15 minutes, you'll see the gap up in the morning, and then I'll usually just sell that gap immediately. I don't even, if I can make 10% or more on that gap up, I don't care. I'm out. The trade worked. I move on to the next one. Love it. Love it, love it, man. That's super, super useful. And here's the thing about the whole buying and selling. A lot of people, you, you are correct. There has to be a buyer for every seller and a seller for every buyer. But you have to keep in mind, or not you specifically, we have to keep in mind that you can have one buyer for numerous sellers. Yep. So it can be like an institution. It could be a hedge fund. It could be a mutual fund. It could be a financial advisor. You, you could have one person collecting a bunch of positions. And the reason that that's valuable to know is if you do have one specific company buying a lot or one individual, and we can't see who that individual is, obviously, but if you do have a collection of one specific amount of people who are buying, that person can still react emotionally the following day or the following week, right? If they get trapped and they have to unload their positions, that one particular bank or institution can be forced to start liquidating either bull or bear positions. And if that's the case, that can cause enthusiasm in one specific direction, right? Well, and two, right? If this is, if this is one person, let's say, and it's the, it's spy, right? So this is definitely not going to be just one person, but let's say right. it, it's maybe the top five holders were 80% of this or something, whatever, whatever yep. the case was, we, they, they are now, absorbing all the supply whereas yep. if all of these if all of this volume was 2000 different traders those 2000 different traders are all probably going to sell at different times and it's not going to allow the supply to be absorbed as much because you may have 250 traders just scalp it for you know literally a couple points and then maybe the other 25% of them hold for 2% the other the other 25% will actually hold for a gain and that that messes up the supply and demand equation. So the bigger the gulp, the bigger the fish that comes in and eats that, the more kind of supply is then taken off the market and they are pretty much in control of that supply until they do something with it. Whereas if you've got 2000 traders that take up the same gulp as the, the whale does, 
they're all different little, you know, people doing the different activities. Whereas that one guy is probably just going to do one thing. Uh, bingo. And that's your, your spot on. So that's the thing you got to keep in mind traders is like the, the volume, volume and price are such absolutely evidentiary, I mean, evidentiary focuses on what sentiment and what's going to cause markets to move because it is actual people who are being affected by these moves, robot or not, you're still going to have people who either programmed it or making these moves and they're going to be impacted by these price fluctuations. Yep. I want to show you guys probably one of the coolest case studies of the week so far. Here. Remember we are, um, this is kind of the, the strategy, right? We're anchoring this area uh, from this reversal. In this case, this was on February 25th. I think this was earnings for NEO. Um, and then we, we had a hard reversal. But notice what happened here. This supply zone has been here the entire time. I have this, like, I did not change this, uh, this uh, graphic here, the supply zone that's been there. Look what happened to the price today and look where, where it got rejected. Literally right at the supply zone. And why do we call it a supply zone here and a demand zone here? Well, we know when the price is below here, we know that this is supply because these are people that are holding at a loss. So, you know, these people initially bought on the dip here, you know, initially the stock was trading at five bucks. All of a sudden it's trading at 390 and people are like, holy crap, I just got a steal on this thing. Next thing they know it's at 230 and uh, they've got to hold through this massive drawdown. So now as the price gets back up and they start breaking even, if enough people start to break even here, they're going to add to the supply on the market and that's where you get the rejection. Yeah, perfect. Can you show us how a lot of this will apply to day trading on a sh shorter term time frame? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, even GE right now, we could probably do it. I had someone reach out to me the other day. His name, you'll know him very well, David Wygant. He, um, yes. he said, hey, man, let's have a competition on GE where you have to buy 100,000 shares and your stop is five cents and let's see who can win the most or lose the most. <laughs> I was like... But the funny thing is you can do that on GE though. You know, 100,000 shares is nothing. Yep. I mean, obviously, you know, you got to have the margin for it. I'm, I'm just saying that as far as the spread, I mean, you're going to get filled at that penny, no problem. All right. So here's the 65 minute. The reason why I'm using the 65 minute chart is because. Oh, 65. Okay. Yeah. It will. It's not something I came up with. It's, I learned this from Brian Shannon as well, but if you're using the 65 minute chart, you have each candle that you're showing is an even candle. If you use the 60 minute chart and you divide 390 divided by 60, it's 6.5. So you actually have a half of a candle Correct. on our 60 minute chart. So I like to use the 65 minute one because it's even candles across the time frames, And two, you've got a big um, group of generally very smart money using the 65 minute time frame, whether that's actual traders, humans trading the 65 minute, or that's an algorithm that's tied to a 65 minute indicator or something like that. Um, or that's, a, that's an algorithm that's looking for a hammer on the 65 minute rather than the 60. Remember, if there's enough money trading a specific time frame or pattern, that becomes self-fulfilling because they are making the market. And so, um, you know, that's something to really keep in mind. In this case for GE, Notice on the 65 minute candle, if we anchor the average, the, if we anchor the uh, VWAP from this point, notice where we caught a bid right above this zone. Now, if, and this is where the alert zone, uh, alert system comes in. If you're not able, let's say that you got to do something for 10 minutes, you know, you're trading on the 65 minutes. So you may have a little time to do something during the day. Let's say that, you know, you're watching this anchored VWAP, but the price never gets down to it. You're able to create an alert at this line, and then I'm able to actually capture the margin of error around this area. So I would have then been alerted anytime the price got within eight cents of the VWAP, rather than having to say, alert me when it gets exactly to this line. Because the market doesn't work like that. The, the price doesn't react exactly to a line. There's a margin of error around anything, whether that's because somebody got impulsive or somebody got uh, you know, a margin call and liquidated you're not always gonna hit an exact area. So having this kind of cloud around, whether that's a trend line or a VWAP is really important.
Mm, got it. Got it. Got it. So this is how I would use this in a day trade setting. Um, for me personally, I'm looking at the fact that since we bottomed out here on April 24th, I would say this was kind of your capitulation um, from anyone who that was going to sell sold here. Uh, we did hit a higher low, which was nice. So since this point, notice what's happening. Notice that most of the volume has is really aggregated right around this zone here. If we go into, let's say, the five minute, you'll be able to see that even better. Um, and I was actually trading GE on the five minute and entering on the five minute earlier today. And this is what I was doing. What I did was, and this is cool because I, I have this on set up because this is what I was trading. So I, I was looking at divergence and I was looking at the anchored view app from this point in time. And uh, sorry, no, it wasn't that anchored view app. Which one was it? I guess this one. Yeah, it was this one. Sorry, not this one. So what I was doing was I was looking at the anchored view app from this capitulation point. You can see that it touched it perfectly here. And notice the anchored view app is tested on this candle, but not tested on the 65 minute candle because it's taking uh, a different close on the 65 minute than the five. So when I mm -hmm. anchor it from this five, look at how precisely it touched right here. So I entered the uh, May 15th, 750 calls right here. I already had some, but I uh, decided to buy some more just because yeah. my position from yesterday had some good profits and I wanted to kind of continue with those. But look here, we've got the anchored volume by price from the same point. We could tell there was a ton of people here. Notice the price was able to shoot through this zone because there wasn't a lot of volume until we got to this next area. So now naturally the price is having trouble breaking through this zone because we have to get through all those break even holders now. Mm. So the reason that I got in this was the, divergence on the Williams percent range. Um, I love to use the Williams percent range. It has done uh, a lot of good for me. I'm not sure if I used the five though. I may have used, uh, no, I used the five. They must have. Good old they, Williams percent. Yep. So in this case, I was, this definitely was divergence before we had, no, we still have it. Sorry. So if you compare this, this is negative 100 to negative 100. I mean, so technically these are pretty much bottomed out, but look, the price is lower. So yeah. generally when I see kind of a, a double bottom on a, per, on a uh, oscillator and then a lower low here, that will make me pretty bullish to get in. And for me, I mean, GE is just such a laggard right now. I was looking for a time to get in and this was, pretty much just, you know, the anchored view app is so precise. I, I was, I'm, I'm teaching my college buddies right now how to trade and we all jumped in right here. My one buddy's up like 60% on his options and he's about to have a field day. Um, so uh, no, it's, uh, it's one of those things that um, this is not just a swing trade tool. This is something that can be used in a fractal type um, situation where it, you can use it on the daily the same way you can use it on the five minute. Got it. Very interesting. Yeah. For the intraday time frame, I've been practicing a lot on the 30 minute kind mm -hmm. of for the same reason and rationale that you're referring to with the whole, um, you know, the one hour candles, people like them, but 30 minutes, you do get that clean section mm -hmm. and you know, you, it does work. I mean, like everything works sometimes, not always, but yep. yeah. Well, the thing I mean there's a million different strategies that work it's about being able to be comfortable with the strategy that you implement I mean you have to know if your personality is going to be able to deal with a drawdown that's got a really aggressive strategy or a strategy that's got a really aggressive drawdown like um, <coughs> I deal that with my <clears throat> I deal with that myself I'll be like oh shit I was not planning on this big of a drawdown um, and you know you have to kind of be like did the plan change that's my biggest thing. If I need, you know, as a trader, sticking to the plan is harder than trying to figure out when to buy or sell. Um, you know, with buying or selling, you have, okay, if this happens, that happens. Um, with, with just, uh, you know, in general, holding and just um, being able to know when to get out and when to do all that good stuff uh, does take some emotion, uh, emotional strength and being able to say, okay, I said I was going to do this and I'm just not going to change from that plan. 
Uh, so holding is 100% probably one of the hardest parts of trading, just knowing to, all right, I'm up, but my goal was X amount of profit. Um, but when you're trading options, that's kind of hard because you can get killed on the Greeks. So, you know, um, just because you didn't hit your exact profit target or profit percent target, you know, for me, those options yesterday, I sold those options, those uh, 515 May call, uh, May 15th, uh, what were those, 750 calls for 19 cents. And I just rebought them at 10 cents. Yeah. Uh, 10 cents. So, you know, GE is pretty much at the same exact price it was yesterday, except IV got crushed today from earnings. Crushed. So, so now, now that IV's kind of taken it easy a little bit, I'm okay jumping back in now and, in, in, um, you know, scaling back in essentially. Got it. Now, do you find yourself doing more day trades or swing trades? Like what's kind of like your favorite time frame? It depends. I mean, dude, if I, uh, for example, CGC, uh, this is a trade that I entered on Friday. Um, I entered the- Good May for you. Yeah, that was a fun one. Uh, I entered the May uh, 15th. Sorry, let me pull up the chart here. So why Friday? What told you that that thing might pop? Uh, laggard. Tilray yeah. was ripping and this thing hadn't moved yet. So naturally I love to trade the CGC lag to Tilray. A lot of the time you'll see Tilray or CGC moving. This is one that you watch often just to remind people. This is one that's on your list frequently. Yep. 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 And so same thing, right? We've got this huge demand zone here. You've got the price just finally getting to a point where there's no more supply in the market. The re I got in at 1498 on the, uh, May 15th, uh, $15 call. So I pretty much bat, bought um, at the money. And uh, I was up 50% on this day. And I was like, oh, this could be a beautiful day trade. But it hadn't even broken out yet. It had not broken through this anchored VWAP, which it had done on Tilray. So this is where you can use that anchored VWAP as a lagging kind of tool. I did not sell this yet because I knew that it was going to break through this anchored view app because Tilray had done it already. So me stupidly, I sold right at the open on Monday. I mean, I still made 60% in less than a trading day. I cannot complain about that. Um, but those did rip another, like, I think I bought them at, uh, whew, actually I can't even remember where I bought them, but I was up 60% and then all of a sudden they were up. Oh, sorry. I bought them at 97 cents. I sold them at this area at uh, 157. And then here, those things were at like 350 or four. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, as a trader, you can't go back and, and get mad about a 60% gain. But what you can do is you can go and say, okay, well, maybe I should have scaled out a little slower and, and held some and stuck to the plan. It's just that gap, man. So that open, you see how like it's clearing the your anchored view app. It's also clearing all of those wicks for like a week and a half, like a month almost. Yep. So it's just squeezing all the shorts that open. It's just a, a really good gap, especially, and since it happened on a Monday, if you go to a weekly chart, so you got a gap on a daily and a weekly. So then you're really starting to compress multiple time frames where you have a gap. So you have not only days worth of people who are trapped, but you also have weeks worth of people who are trapped. Yep, and check this out. Pretty cool example on the uh, anchored volume by price. If we start, this is really cool because what we can say here is, we can say we know what the volume profile is for this broadening descending pattern. And we know that this is the volume profile because we're starting it from the very beginning. So this is what this, the volume profile looks like for this particular um, pattern. So you can see most people are still holding at a loss. A majority of the population that has traded this as far as shares go, if you want to say that, is still holding around 19 to 21 bucks. So this is going to act as a magnet above. So as supply dries up, remember, the price dropped here because people were panicking and were taking losses and were likely getting liquidated in some funds. Yeah. But as, as the supply dries up, the supply zone is here. So this is where the target becomes because this is where the price is kind of going to vacuum up to, just like we saw in, um, in Neo. So Neo, same exact thing. You had that gap up today. 
Uh, this is the weekly. If we go to the daily, same concept. You can use it on any time frame. Literally gapped up right into the supply zone. Yeah. So if I, if I were going to, you know, guess what C, CGC is going to do, I'm assuming it's going to gap up into that supply zone. Very similar to kind of what Neo did here. Sure. And it, I mean, I, I just think from a legalization standpoint, I don't know if they're going to technically federally legalize it, but I think states are going to become a lot more open yeah. to it because states are hurting right now. Their tax revenues are down huge. Um, you've had the federal government had to step in to help them out. So naturally, legalizing marijuana is going to bring in revenue. Uh, I live in Colorado and it is uh, oh, yeah, dude. a industry here. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> a lot of joint ventures being created out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, so last question, how much of your day do you spend in front of, in front of the screen, charting, doing all this? Oh man. Uh, I wake up around, let's say, 6, 6.15 a.m. Denver time. So that's about, you know, uh, 8.15 Eight Eastern. Eastern yeah. And then I'm pretty much looking at the charts from 7 to – I mean, I'm not looking at it constantly. <laughs> you're it's, saying you're obsessed is what you're it, saying. I get it. Yeah, I, but for me, like, you know, a be lot. Be obsessed of, or be average, man. Uh, yeah, and that's, you know, the, the thing for me is as, as somebody who's trying to sell TrendSpider as a product to be useful, I can't go try to convince people that this get, gives you an edge if I can't even get an edge in the market with it. Uh -huh. So I, I constantly want to find new ways to use this. I want to look and say, here's an example of when this happened. Here's an example of that happened. So, you know, I can come and say, Hey, th this is what happened. You know, I, I have examples of, of theories that I'm going over. Whereas, you know, let's say you're a cook and you won't even try your food. I don't know if I want to try that. <laughs> so uh, it's the same kind of concept. And so that's, that's kind of where the passion comes from. But like I said, I've been trading since I was 12. There's never been a day where I haven't looked at almost tick by tick of the market. I mean, if I had to guess how many market hours I've been, I've had watching the market, I, it's gotta be over 50,000. Uh, I Love mean, it. I literally, <laughs> it's, it, I had a cell phone in, in middle school and the high school, uh, in the high school. And, you know, I was even back in the day, jumping on that really sketchy internet, like on the flip phones, trying to look at my stocks. So, sure. uh, you know, it's, I've, I've really spent a lot of time looking at the market, feel, feeling the ebbs and the flows. And the more that you do that, the more you're able to kind of just feel the market. Bingo, man. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for enriching all the lives out there, the people that you try to impact and you work on impacting every single day and week to help them understand this, mystery because once they do and once they really grasp it and they start understanding it it gives them a tool to access financial freedom so thanks jake hey you're very welcome thanks for having me thank you everyone for listening in and um yeah if you have any questions let me know you can reach out or uh follow me at trendspider jake or just at trendspider you can send us a dm there and we'll get back to you too yeah man appreciate your time everyone from around the world thank you for tuning in thank you for being here means the world to me, and let's continue enriching lives together. Each and every one of you rock, and until next time, love yeah. life, live like a trade it by.